Welcome, everyone. It is April 8, 2023. We are exactly one year to the day before the Great American Total Solar Eclipse Part 2. And for those of you who are not aware, or maybe you are aware, on April the 8th, 2024, we've got another total solar eclipse coming to the United States. And we're going to talk today just briefly about some preliminary total solar eclipse plans so that you can start thinking and preparing ahead of time. And basically the gist of this conversation is, what would you do if the total solar eclipse were held today, April 8, 2023? And again, it'll be one year from today, April 8, 2024. You're looking at a, a live shot here, not really a live shot, but a simulation of cloud cover and weather conditions using the Ventusky or Ventusky, however you wanna say it, weather app. You can get this for free on your phone or you can just go to the website VentuSky.com, plug in your location, your date, in this case, April 8, 2023, 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time, which is right around the time that totality would occur. And you can see kind of what the cloud cover is in the path of totality. Again, if the eclipse were held today, April 8, 2023, one year to the day before it actually occurs. So we'll get to this in just a minute, but before we do, let me just kind of give everybody a rundown of what's going on here, just to refresh everybody. So again, um, next year, 2024, April 8, there is a total solar eclipse coming to the United States. This is the second one in about seven years. I'm calling this one the heartbreaker because I think a lot of people who are planning to see it won't because of weather. And that's why we're holding this conversation one year to the day ahead of time so you can start thinking about some of the challenges and preliminary plans. Uh, there's actually two solar eclipses coming. There's an annular in October, and then the total will be one year from today, April 8, 2024. We're going to hold off on discussing the annular in this conversation. We'll talk about that later. Right now, we just want to focus on the big one, which is the April 8, 2024 solar eclipse. Now, a solar eclipse occurs when you have an alignment of the sun, moon, and earth and really specifically, it's, a, it's an alignment of the sun, the moon, and you. You need to make the effort to get into the path of totality if you want to see the, the corona of the sun and the dramatic, all the dramatic effects of the solar eclipse. And there's a, a, the term in, in astronomy is syzygy, which is an alignment of celestial bodies, in this case, sun, moon, earth. But really, it's an alignment of you on the earth to get into the moon's shadow and a misalignment of the clouds, which is what we're gonna talk about. Now, the good news is many of us saw it six years ago. Again, you can see that we were scattered throughout the path of totality for the August 21, 2017 eclipse. First one in 38 years at that time, many of us were solar eclipse virgins. And the good news is we're not virgins anymore. But for those of you who are, we sincerely hope that you lose your solar eclipse virginity a year from today, which is why we're holding this call. Um, and you can see some of the <clears throat> dramatic pictures of the corona that some of our members have taken. This one was in Clarksville, Tennessee. Freddie took this one in Perryville, Missouri. Ross Sackett loved this shot in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bob Knight in Kentucky. Uh, these are two really great shots. One on the left by my lady, Sarah Wong in Dover, Tennessee. This one is not from the MAS, but I put it in there anyway. Somebody posted this on Facebook. I uh, love the shot of the Waffle House. Very appropriate for the South. Um, for those of you who subscribe to Sky and Telescope magazine, there's a write-up on the solar eclipse for the April edition, April 2023, uh, Sky and Telescope magazine. I would encourage you to check that out. And you can see a shot here that Fred Espinak took in Casper, Wyoming, a composite of the partial and total phases of the eclipse. Really cool image. I was in Lebanon, Tennessee, and we had about, whoops two minutes and 32 seconds of totality. And I was able to see the corona. We had cloud cover early, um, but it was great. And two minute, two and a half minutes was about the maximum duration for the total solar eclipse of 2017. Another great shot here of the corona from Sky and Telescope magazine. And this was taken in Madras, Oregon. You can really see the dramatic effects of the corona. Point I want to make here is we can show you pictures all day long, but there's no substitute for what the human eye can see during totality. 
the corona is not a static thing. Once you go from those last few seconds of the diamond ring and then the Bailey's beads and then totality occurs and you're looking at the sun and you see this dark spot where the sun, it, you know, used to be the photosphere. And then you see the corona and it's just these flecks of light coming out uh, as the plasma is streaming around the magnetic field lines of the sun. It's just an incredibly dramatic effect. And you can actually see prominences. So this is your shot. This is really your one shot to see it with the naked eye. Again, during totality. We'll talk about that, you know, later. But um, if you have the opportunity to see totality, uh, you really need to make every every effort to do this. Again, April 8, 2024, because it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity or very rare opportunity. Here is the path of totality. You can see it going through Mexico, parts of Texas, Arkansas, southern Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Of course, we live in Memphis, Tennessee, so we're only about a two-hour drive to the path. And the duration for this eclipse is about twice as long as the one for 2020 or for 2017. So you can see here, if you're near the center line, I've got Sulphur Springs near Dallas, Texas highlighted here. Four minutes and 21 seconds, potentially, of duration. That's four and a half minutes almost under the corona, uh, you know, under the moon shadow, and you see in the corona the sun. That's just amazing. And we're coming out of a period of solar maxima, so the corona is going to be more active this time. So I really encourage you to try and check this out if you can. Um, here's a couple other shots here, but really what I want to do is show you a couple of websites that you can go to to learn more. And I like the eclipse. I like the website mystereclipse.com. I know there's other ones out there. If you're aware of them, feel free to use them. I like Mystery Eclipse. This has got a wealth of information. This is Fred Espinox's web, uh, website, and he is a astrophysicist, retired, does public lectures and presentations on the solar eclipse all around the world. He's been viewing them since 1970. If you go to his website, you can see here Solar Eclipse Preview 2011 to 2030. If you click on that link. And you scroll down, you can actually see a breakdown of all the solar eclipses over the last 15, 20 years or so. And you can actually go out into the future, too. I mean, this guy's got solar eclipses that go thousands of years into the future. But here you can see the links for the two that are coming up. Um, so we'll click on this one. Again, one year to the day, April 8, 2024, we've got a total solar eclipse coming. You can see where it's going to be located. If you bring that up, again, mystereclipse.com. This will bring you to a breakdown of this solar eclipse. And if you go to this link here, it's a Google map of the total solar eclipse. It, can, it brings up a separate Google map of the path of totality. And you can actually zoom in and plan essentially where you want to be. You can zoom in here and get really specific details on a map of the United States. And again, we're located in Memphis. You may be somewhere else if you're watching this video, so you can plan accordingly. But you can see here some of the places that are in the totality path, Little Rock being one of them, only two and a half hour drive. If I click here, it will tell me that I have a maximum duration of two minutes and 24 seconds if I was in Little Rock. And again, that's why you want to get as close to the center line as possible. Get this thing to go away here. Um, so that would mean areas along I-40 toward, you know, Fort Smith. If you get just west of Conway, you're near the center line, you get about four minutes and 16 seconds of duration under the corona. So that's pretty good. And then, of course, you can see here further south as you go into Texas and you can you can zoom in, you can zoom out and get all the specifics if you want. Again, if you were near Conway, just west along I-40, you get four minutes and 16 seconds of duration. The partial phase would begin, this is universal time. So in central time, you back five hours out. So 17 minus five is, I'm doing the math correct, 12.30. 12.30 p.m. central time is when the partial phases would begin. Um, again, you need filtered glasses or a telescope to see the partial phases. Totality would begin at 18.50. Again, back five hours out from universal time. That's one, if I'm doing the math here correctly, about 1.50 in the afternoon. So you're going to want to be ready around 1.30 p.m. Central Time, April 8, 2024, if you were located near Conway, Arkansas, to see totality. And again, you got four minutes and 16 seconds. So and you can do this anywhere along the eclipse path or wherever you're planning to go. Now, 
We're going to talk about weather here in just a second. I'm going to bring in some of my colleagues for discussion. For me personally, I don't trust the weather in Arkansas or any place north. So I'm targeting southwest Arkansas as a potential spot to be prepared to go to the day before. I like Texarkana. Um, from Texarkana, you've got, a, you've got a shot if you want to to get into Texas if it's clear there. And near the center line, you can either go west along I-30 toward Dallas, or you could go north toward De Queen, which is also near the center line. These are more rural areas. I'd have to scout out the terrain specifically. But that's kind of what I'm thinking, and I'll tell you why. If I go back to my presentation here, um, again, this is what the weather map looked like one year ago. And again, if you get this from the Sky and Telescope magazine article from April 8, uh, from April 2023, this is what the weather looked like, cloud cover, on uh, April the 8th, 2022. And you can basically see that all the states from Arkansas up until Ohio were cloud cover. So Texas was your one shot. Having said all that, if I bring up Ventusky, and I look at a shot of what the cloud cover looks like today, April 8, 2023, you can see here that Texas would be a bad bet if you were setting up for, for that state, assuming again that the eclipse were to occur today. Um, so we, we would be looking pretty good if we were targeting Arkansas. Again, Little Rock, not too bad. You get up toward Conway, maybe a little bit more risky, although cloud cover just west of Conway, if you were near the center line, doesn't look too bad. And I know there's a spot near Jonesboro that some of us were targeting. But notice down here in Texarkana, um, very little cloud cover, if any. And I know this is static. We're about four hours away from totality, if it were to occur today. It's about 9.50 a.m. Central Time, April 8, 2023. So again, if you were targeting, again, assuming the eclipse were to happen today, if you were targeting Texarkana, you would have a pretty good shot, basically, at seeing totality if you were um, targeting this area here. Now, Sulphur Springs on the center line, not good. About 40% cloud cover. Further north, Toward the Queen, near the center line, about 0% cloud cover. And <clears throat> you didn't want to drive that far. Hot Springs, you're not quite on the center line, but you're looking pretty good here. 0% cloud cover. If I go back to my solar eclipse map and I zoom in here, um, if you were in Hot Springs and you had clear skies, you'd get about three and a half minutes of duration during totality. So that's three and a half minutes to look at the corona. That's really good. So anyway, I've talked enough here. Um, at this point in time, I am going to bring in my esteemed and very notorious colleague, Mr. Rick Honey. And he and I, of course, um, did some preliminary planning seven years ago for the last solar eclipse, and I know he's got some thoughts. So, Rick, welcome. Feel free to jump in. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where I'm right. Tell me where I'm crazy. <laughs> well, we start out with the with the last uh, parameter, and I thought that was just a given. You being crazy. That's. <laughs> You know, That's, you yeah, mentioned something I'm earlier saying. that I actually hadn't considered, and 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 you're almost looking at it right now. in, in the map you've got up, there is a distinct possibility that the entire nation could be clouded out uh, next year on this day, uh, and that would be the great disappointment. Um, you, you know, we did last year. We did a whole lot of planning. Um, months in advance a year in advance we went almost two years ahead of it we went to a conference at uh uh carbondale 
Yeah, we went to a conference to to talk about planning and everything. Um, I contacted the National Transportation Board to ask what they were planning for uh, traffic control and and what have you, because there would be a an, a mass flood of people trying to get to the um, get to the path of totality and. They uh, thanked me kindly for reminding them because they hadn't considered it at all. And, of course, we all saw uh, not so much traffic jams getting to the eclipse, but traffic jams after the eclipse trying to get back home. Interstate 40 from Nashville was backed up for hours. Um, But weather-wise, you know, we would planned on perhaps going uh, northwest and what have you, thinking that was our best chance for clear skies and uh you know turned out three days ahead of time that they were going to be clouded out and we stood our best chance and we were iffy you know we had people uh that went into missouri we had uh that were cloudy right until the moment of the eclipse and the clouds broke for a few of them uh there were people in nashville um my uh, I, I graduated high school in Hendersonville, Tennessee, which is right next to Gallatin, Tennessee. And I had a lot of uh, friends and stuff, but Gallatin was planning a big shindig in the city park, which is right on the line of uh, totality. And they couldn't find uh, an amateur astronomer or, or anyone around Nashville that would come up and host their event or speak about the eclipse during their event. They had bands playing and carrying on and they got in touch with MAS and I thought, well, that's kind of neat. Go back to where I went to school. And, and uh, but I told them when they invited about a year in advance that uh, basically three days in advance of it, if they didn't have a 70% chance of being clear, I wouldn't commit. You know, I, I said, you know, uh, if it's going to be clear someplace else, uh, unfortunately, that's where I'm going. So turned out that three days in advance, they had a pretty good uh, chance of being clear. So I went ahead and went up there and turned out to be great. It was an uh, excellent uh, situation. So and quite it was my first eclipse first total eclipse and and it was quite stunning um i did something that you know the professional eclipse goers advise you not to and that is uh you know if it's your first eclipse don't bother trying to take pictures or what have you i set up video cameras so that they had a live feed of it there on their big screen at the uh, on stage and then, of course, had my own uh, camera taking pictures. And and they came out okay. I wasn't focused on trying to get, I mean, the camera was focused. I wasn't uh, focused on trying to get great pictures. I got a few decent ones. Uh, but it was quite, oh, uh, I wouldn't say overwhelming, but it was amazing to, to see it suddenly go dark and Yet out on the horizon, 360 degrees, you could see light. So you knew you were under a shadow, you know, and the temperature dropped. And and it was it was quite amazing, quite an amazing event. You know, you can start to understand why ancient peoples would uh, consider these uh, omen telling and and uh, magical. Uh, so. Uh, uh, as far as next year goes, I, you know, my plans are, uh, you know, forget trying to make hotel reservations someplace. It's it's three days in advance. And if I can't get there in my truck, then uh, I missed it, you know, but I can pretty much get just about any place in the country in three days. So, yeah, uh, that, that's my plan. Three days in advance. That's as good as the weather uh predictors appear to be and and that's been that way for decades you know anything beyond three days their their likelihood of being correct is uh dramatically decreased so um right i tell you it could be as 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 soon as 24 hours in advance i mean this weather map if you look at it yesterday at this time has even changed somewhat now 
this area down here hasn't changed much, neither has Texas. Little Rock actually improved. And I, I tell you, I, I would not have said this even a week or two ago that um, Indiana and Ohio might even be potentially in play. Now, if you look at the map here, um, let me see if I can scroll down, zoom out here. So as far as where totality would be, you can see that Indianapolis is very close to the center line, just south actually. And then Cincinnati or just outside Dayton, Ohio, you'd have to drive up towards Sydney and I can't even begin to pronounce that name, but you got a straight, straight shot along I-75. So if you look here and then you look at the weather map, um, again, it's gotten worse since yesterday. So certainly I would not recommend it right now, but you can see where the edge of the clouds is. This is, you're in the path here near the center line. You'd have to go north of Indianapolis. And if you went north of Dayton, right here toward the center line, you would still have about 90% cloud cover until you get toward Lima, then it drops down. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it today, but if you were looking at this earlier and you were saying, okay, it's a, it's a day before the eclipse, where am I going? You wouldn't necessarily rule out uh, Northeastern Ohio or Northern Indiana. But, um, you know, for us, for us living in Memphis, it's basically you're targeting Arkansas and or maybe northeastern Texas, if you can get there in a day. It's about a four and a half hour drive, give or take, to Texarkana, again, assuming no traffic on, on that particular day. But, you know, Rick, if, going back to your point, three days in advance, if I can't get there by driving there the day of, forget it. That's actually not bad given what we're looking at right now. Again, assuming that this 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 weather pattern was in fact holding a year from now. Not holding, but this is what the what this is what the weather would look like a year in advance. So it's a tricky thing in April because you just never know. I mean, you can see quite a bit of the path here covered in clouds and Interestingly enough, and maybe ominously enough, a lot of the veteran eclipse chasers are targeting Texas. Understandably so. Your chances are probably better in Texas. But look here, you know, Waco near the center line, 100% cloud cover. San Antonio, which is in the path, not too bad, but still pretty risky. And then some of these other areas in central Texas, you know, you're basically betting that this is not what it's going to look like a year from now. But if you're making plans, uh, even Texas is at risk. So, yeah, can we can drive you, there within a day or a half a day. Yeah, given my ties with the my long career with the Boy Scouts, um, if indeed Arkansas is clear, I will likely be at uh, Kaikima Scout Reservation, just a little north and uh, west of Hardy, Arkansas. Uh, probably hosting uh, a whole bunch of Boy Scouts. So where is Hardy here? Let's see, uh, Newport. That's where I was born, actually. Oh, Newport. Okay. So if we look on the map here, uh, it's um, north of Batesville. There it is. Okay. So you're getting pretty close to the center line also. Cave City, Batesville. So you're right in this area right here. A little north of all that, but yeah. Okay. Um, that would be a good place. Conway, Batesville. Oh, there it is. So yeah. Again, today, your chances are really good up in this area right here. Right. So cloud cover, 10% max. And in terms of duration, you know, just guessing here, but about four minutes of duration. That would be really cool. That would be really cool. And I know Freddie mentioned that also. So, um. 
again, kind of a short call today. We're not really getting into too many specifics about how to photograph the eclipse or, you know, some of the other things. We'll cover that at a future time. But we did want to make you aware of weather and be thinking about it. Obviously, a year in advance is, is no way to get any kind of reliable forecast. You start 10 days out, then you go about seven days out, then you go about three days out. And then from there, you kind of you kind of take the leap. Um, one of the things I like about this corridor from Little Rock to Texarkana is you've got interstate all in the path here. Now, I know you're on the edge of the path, but you've got a lot to play with here between Little Rock and Dallas. And assuming, again, you got a forecast kind of like this one, where you're right on the edge of the clouds, and you want to dodge the clouds, you conceivably have, I don't know, the better part of 200, 300 miles, whatever it is, I haven't mapped it out specifically, but you can be driving along the edge of the totality path to try to miss the clouds into Dallas if you want, or up to Little Rock if you want. Now, obviously, if the whole thing is clouded out, then you're kind of sunk. But um, roughly five hours from Memphis to Texas County. Right. Right. So, and again, you're in the path. So yep. you have multiple opportunities to jump out. If you, you know, you get stuck for whatever reason, or you just got to make, you know, just make the call. And um, you can be traveling in the path for, for quite a while and trying to dodge the clouds in this area here. So, and then of course, if you see a forecast like this 24 hours in advance to Rick's point, you could always go north, either target Conway along I-40, or in his particular case, you know, in a perfect world, we all gather here at that Boy Scout camp. Rick does his, his presentation. We all see the corona and cheer together, maybe hear the wildlife and see some of the other dramatic effects. And then, you know, we 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 collectively celebrate. Um, the good news with the last one is we all saw it. The bad news is we all were scattered, so we weren't necessarily together. Um, it would be great if we could be together for this one. So anyway. Check out the Ventusky Sky app. <clears throat> Get familiar with it. Rick, I don't know if you have any other recommendations for weather apps or anything that's more reliable. We'll, we'll, we'll post. Some, we've got some links to some weather um, features on our website. And um, uh, I'm going to be looking at the different weather modeling systems that the National Weather Service uses um, in the near future and perhaps get some links up there. So you at least have some idea of how the weather predictors are coming up with their models. Actually, I do work some, do some work with the National Weather Service and ham radio and trying to help storm chasers and what have you. Um, and, and in that, I have been uh, I have links at the National Weather Service uh, Forecast Office in Memphis. So um, I am going to talk to them about the different weather models they're using and get closer to it, which ones they think are going to be the most accurate. There's essentially five different weather modeling systems out there that they use. And essentially, their basic premise is when three of them agree, that's a pretty good forecast. <laughs> So, um, yeah. we'll, I'll be looking into that and hopefully we'll provide some more information about that later. Yeah, we got a year to kind of hone in on this and give people some guidance on getting a more accurate uh, prediction or modeling for weather. But you can see here, we're talking a lot about clouds and not a lot about the corona. So if we haven't sold you on the corona yet, then it's not as high a priority. But the one lesson we learned from six years ago is it really is all about the clouds. I mean, I hate to pour salt into people's wounds, but 
you can see Carbondale here. They were in the path uh, for the last one as well. And they're also in the path for this one. Again, we're a year away, but if it were held today, they likely would be clouded out. It's, it's really sad. They actually years. had, uh, and because they were in the path of both of these, they were actually the center point. And I have even posters from there where they show both paths crossing in Carbondale. And, the, and of course, the university's there, and they had a football stadium full of people watching the eclipse on their big, on their jumbotron, right? Their big screen out there. But they were clouded out. So they were having to get a live feed from uh, sources outside of their area to be able to actually see it on the jumbotron. They had parades and uh, uh, all sorts of stuff in Carbondale. Probably will again this time. Yeah. <laughs> if you want a party, go to Carbondale or some of those places. And, you know, you sincerely hope it works out because it would be great for anyone there to see the eclipse in a packed stadium with, you know, a thousand, several thousand cheering people. Um, but I tell you, Rick, you know, you're in this hobby or this profession long enough. The one thing you learn is clouds are very inconsiderate and don't care about other people's schedules. And clouds rule. Yeah. You know, they unfortunately don't care about rare astronomical events. So if you want to see this, and I, again, I would highly recommend if you're just being made aware of this now, April 8, 2024, a total solar eclipse is coming to the United States. Make every effort to clear your schedule that day and get into the path of totality. I know it's on a Monday. People are working. Kids have to go to school. Get the kids out of school. Uh, call in sick that day, you know. You're, you're not going to have an opportunity like this again anytime soon. In fact, it'll be 22 years, August the 12th, 2045, before we get another solar eclipse that comes this close to Memphis. So you can travel, but to have one come to you is pretty rare. So take the day off of work, get the kids out of school, make a holiday out of it. It should be a national holiday, April 8, 2024. Make the effort to travel into the totality path because 90%, even 99% ain't going to cut it. You got to get into this path of totality in order to see the eclipse. And, you know, you'll see the corona, you see the, the shadow bands, change in temperature that Rick was alluding to. If you're near wildlife, all the dramatic effects of, you know, crickets chirping or animals bedding down for the night, birds, you know, just whatever. Um but I'd really encourage everyone, if you're watching this for the first time and you're just now being made aware, make an effort to travel into the path of totality for the April 8, 2024 total solar eclipse. And I'll just show you the path again one more time on my slideshow here. And you can kind of see it. You know, it's about a 124 mile wide path. That again starts in southern Texas, just clips San Antonio, Waco's in the center, Dallas uh, just west of the center line, um, it, up into Arkansas here, Little Rock right on the edge, southern Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Indiana, Indianapolis near the center line. For those of us in Memphis, we got a real great, great opportunity here um, to see this. And Again, I'll just show you this also so that people are made aware. You, you're going to need special eyeglasses during the partial phases. And we're going to be doing more presentations on this to make people aware of this um, and even actually have glasses available for people. But during totality, when, you, when the moon blocks out the photosphere of the sun, you can look at the sun naked eye. And I, I would encourage you to look at the sun during those three or four minutes, wherever you are, to see the corona, to see the uh, prominences, if there are any, and really to see just how dramatic the sun looks. Not the sun, but the eclipsed sun. Let me say that correctly here. You don't see the light of the sun. You see the, the, the disk of the moon blocking out the photosphere of the sun. Um, but you only got a couple minutes to do that. And during the partial phases, you need special eclipse glasses. And there's a company in town here, American Paper Optics, that sells these Eclipse glasses. And we actually had some aid for 
for um, those in our community. And they actually sell binoculars for this as well. I like these. I've got several pair. You can order them at greatamericaneclipse.com. Cost about 129 bucks a piece, but man, it's worth it. As you can see the sun up close, you can see the partial phases, you can see sunspots. Um, anyway, I have that a is a total story to tell about these binoculars. My truck okay. broke into someone stole that pair of binoculars. I, I, it, the only, you know, the real heartbreak about that was, you know, that as soon as they tried to look through them, they threw them away thinking they were <laughs> defective. <laughs> that was so silly. <laughs> they probably tried to do bird watching with those binoculars, not not solar watching. Is that right? Yeah. Oh man, sad story. I'll get you another pair, Rick. I I, I got them. I replaced them. That's good. All right. Um, let me let me add one more thing before we drop, Jeremy. We we heard la uh, prior to the last eclipse about principals and school leaders and what have you. Um, in you know, setting up rules where the children weren't allowed to go outside during the eclipse because they might look at the sun and blind them. And that is the most insane thing I have ever heard of. Please, if you hear this, help spread the word that that kind of thing is not, it's not needed. It's not important. If you've ever tried to actually look at the sun, you, you can't. You can't unless somebody physically holds your head and your eyes open. You're going to close your eyes instinctively. And that's, you know, and trust me, I know that I did that when I was a kid. <laughs> but uh, when it goes totality, you can absolutely look at it. And, and until then, you need eclipse glasses that will reduce the amount of light coming so that you can actually see the edge of the shadow of the moon passing in front of the sun. But uh, until then, you look around, you get a weird, eerie feeling as the moon starts to pass in front of it. it. The lighting outside is just not the same as you'd normally see. In fact, you can see images of the crescent sun uh, where the light's shining through trees and what have you and creates a, a, uh, an effect of a pin aperture camera or whatever. So uh, don't let people tell you to tell their children to stay inside. That's the wrong thing to do. Thanks. That's all I had. Yeah. No, to reiterate that point, I saw a partial eclipse when I was 10 years old on the playground at school. And the, my fourth grade teacher encouraged us to get out and take a look, not at the sun, but we had, you know, filtered paper where you could see, you know, it was about a 40% partial at that time. And one of my classmates had a film and you could look through it and see that bite out of the moon. And I just remember being blown away by that. And I wanted to see a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse so badly. It was heartbreaking to realize I had to wait 33 years until the next solar eclipse. And of course, we saw it six years ago. But yeah, if you have young kids, certainly if you're in the path already, and if it's a clear day, it would be, I wouldn't say, I'll, I'll stop short of saying child abuse, but it would certainly be a disservice to them to have them inside, not outside, you know, looking at or experiencing the, the solar eclipse. You know, do it responsibly. We'll educate, you know, there'll be several ambassadors out there educating people on how to do that with the proper filtering, but during totality, if you can have a youngster experience that effect and then look at the sun during totality, um, it, it could potentially be life changing. You know, who knows? Today, they're so addicted to their phones, but certainly they need to get out and experience this. So anyway, um, final thoughts. Anybody on the call? Anything you want to say? Just going to update the weather map here. Again, we're looking, this is 10 a.m. If I go forward to 1 p.m., right around the time of totality, you can see here the cloud bands. If I'm in Ohio and Indiana, I'm pretty nervous. But if I'm in Arkansas, feeling pretty good. Texarkana, this area, a little risky. But this is a very tricky forecast. 
And you can see, well, Rick, bottom line is if, it, if this is what it looks like a year from now, it's a no brainer. We're going, we're going to Arkansas. And yep. Probably Conway near the center line looks pretty good where you're going to be at that Boy Scout camp just north of Batesville looking pretty good. For those of you in Texas, hate to say it, but it ain't looking good. But this could all change a year from now. So keep an eye on the weather. Um, we're just getting started here with our eclipse plans. I'll throw one more slide up here for anybody watching this. For further information, here are some websites you can check out. Again, I like Mr. Eclipse, Fred Espinox website. Great American Eclipse is another great resource. If you want information on Eclipse Glasses, go to eclipseglasses.com. And they have websites on specifically for the 2024 Eclipse also. So it is April the 8th, 2023. Today, as we're shooting this video, 9.44 a.m., so we're about four hours away from when totality would occur. One year to the day, people think we're stupid for doing this a year in advance because no people don't know what they're going to do next week. But when you get events like this, you want to start spreading awareness and at least showing people what, what they could be dealing with in terms of weather and travel plans and any other logistics. So... It's never too early. In fact, a lot of people have already started planning months in advance, you know, better part of a year ago. So with events like this, it's kind of ironic because we can predict thousands of years in advance to the second when and where a total eclipse is going to occur. But we may not know until seconds in advance where the clouds are going to be. So... Again, it's an alignment of the sun, the moon, and you, and a misalignment of the clouds. And that's what makes this kind of challenging. So, you don't understand anyway, final thoughts. Clouds, look at chaos theory. <laughs> yeah, chaos theory. Exactly. So, um, with that, we will kind of wrap up here. Rick, any other final thoughts? That's all I got. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Well, we'll call it a day. It's Easter weekend. We got plans. We got taxes due a week from today. We got the Masters Golf Tournament on. So there's a lot going on this time of year. I know that. But again, folks, if you're watching this for the first time. April 8, 2024. One year from today. It's on a Monday. Start making plans. Uh, get the day off of work. Get the kids out of school. You know, be prepared to travel. Start checking the weather when we get toward the end of March next year and be prepared to travel three days in advance, maybe even that weekend, you know, make a long weekend out of it. And we got a great opportunity here to see a total solar eclipse, really our last opportunity for about 20 years. So if you're local to the United States, um, we'll do we'll do more presentations. We'll cover this in more detail. I know Rick and I, well, Rick will have more to share as well. And we'll get into maybe some more specifics on how to photograph the eclipse. But there's no substitute for seeing the corona yourself. This is the best camera. Use it during totality. So anyway, Rick, thanks a lot. Everybody else, um, we'll call it a day. And we will see you guys again soon. And another reminder before I let everybody go, I know I'm rambling here, but you want to learn more about our organization, who we are, what we do, and if you're local to Memphis, um, go to our website. That's the Memphis Astronomical Society, memphisastro.org. We are a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education in astronomy and related sciences. Our next meeting is actually April 14, 2023, and we've got a presentation on the sun from a professor. And we usually meet the first Friday of every month. We have a calendar of events so you can see what's coming up. Um, we got a lot of pretty full calendar coming up this month. We meet once a month. We have observing events about once a month or well, several times a month if it's clear. And we're free and open to the general public. And it's a great opportunity to stay informed about astronomy, whether you're in the Memphis area or just in general. So, okay. Thanks again, everybody. 
Happy Saturday. We'll see you soon.